Okay, so um, can you hear me, Vincent? Yes, yes, I can. You're the only one here, so uh, I'm just downloading this PowerPoint. So let me just get it up, and then I will open it, and we will get started. Do you have any questions so far? So far, right now, uh, no. Okay. All right. So. Um, The next chapter deals with genetics. <coughs> so chapter 14. So this is, there's three chapters that are on the final exam. Um, that final, the end of the semester is the 21st of May with the extension. So I'm gonna make this due uh, by the 22nd at midnight. Um, so the final three chapters, chapter 14, 16, and 17, we'll finish up lecture on that probably the 18th, and then you will open up the test that day, and then you'll have it to like the 20 seconds to take it. <coughs> All right, so a lot of stuff that you've learned so far has basically brought you to where we're at now, which is genetics. So genetics is what my specialty is, and this is what I teach at ASU as well. Um, and it's it's looking at how traits are inherited from uh, parents to offspring over generation, and you know how those traits can be affected in a good way or a bad way. So like maybe we evolved a way to break down milk. Uh, which was a, a selective advantage. Or maybe we evolved a broken gene that caused sickle cell anemia, but in places with malaria, that's helpful um, rather than harmful. Uh, well, it's still a little harmful, but for the most part, you know, that's why it stays in the population. So this is sort of the interest is how variation occurs. How, why are there so many different hair colors and eye colors and skin colors and people with different, you know, traits, heights, all this stuff, you know, and this is really interesting to uh, people that, you know, are breeding dogs or thoroughbred racehorses, or even, you know, people that are making eggs for the, to sell at the local supermarket. Because you might want to know, do, if I have two chickens that uh, lay, if I have a chicken that lays big eggs, you know, what does it matter if I breed it with another chicken that its parents lay big eggs? Or, you know, if I breed two big chickens together, will I have big chickens? Um, and then what sort of, what is involved in that? Like what causes that trait? Um, so we're just gonna touch on it in this chapter, but there's whole classes on this stuff um, for genetics. And, and most biology majors have to take genetics uh, it's a requirement, um, and it probably should be because it's super important, especially in modern day medicine. This is how they were able to develop that COVID vaccine so fast is by having a thorough understanding of genetics and the genes underneath all of this stuff. All right, so it's a little history lesson here. Uh, there's not a lot of stuff you need to know about this, but um, I'm just, I, I like to tell this story because I think it's interesting. 
So back in the day, and you know, we're talking, you know, a couple hundred years ago, so not that far back in the day, people thought that if two people had a kid, that that kid was a result of blending of the two parents. Same thing with chickens and all this other stuff. And so, and that was called the blending theory of inheritance. And it was really predominant through the middle ages, all the way up until the late 1800s. Um, and, and so, you know, if you were gonna um, make an analogy, it could be like, you know, if you mix blue and yellow paint together, you get um, green. Or if you mixed, you know, yellow, uh, and orange or yellow and red you would get orange so it's sort of a mixing of things um but there was a monk named gregor mendel and gregor mendel kind of said well if that were true if people from the beginning of time or they all blended together and all these traits blended it would kind of be like taking all a palette of all these different colors and mixing it together and then what would we expect and the and, and his answer was that everyone would look the same, that every trait would already have been blended together, kind of like that brown color you get when you mix all the different paints together. And so Gregor Mendel disputed this blending theory of inheritance. And he was a scientist. Uh, he wanted his parents wanted to be a doctor, but he didn't want to be a doctor. Uh, he went to school because they wanted him to go to school. Back in the day, most schools were at monasteries, so he ended up there. Um, and you don't need to know all this, but this is just, I'm just giving you a sort of a time frame. Uh, you know, with this is the mid 1800s. And, you know, he went, like you said, he wanted to be a doctor, or his parents wanted to be a doctor. He wasn't interested in that. He was interested in math and science, and he was really interested in plants, you know. And so he, he was really good at math and he was really good at biology and he was really good at botany and all of these allowed him to pull off what he pulled off which is basically an understanding of genetics the first person to really understand how things were passed on from generation to generation and so Mendel did a series of experiments um, and these experiments laid the foundation for what we know as genetics so what Mendel did was, you don't need to know any of this stuff. It's just sort of, I'm just, you know, telling the story, but he, he taught uh, at the a local monastery. He, you know, he, he dropped out of school. He didn't want to be a physician. Uh, he was at this monastery teaching and on the side, he decided that he wanted to plant plants and he wanted to, and he did this to see how things were inherited. So in 1857, it, you know, it wasn't that long ago, they had, you know, stores just like, you know, Little House on the Prairie or whatever. And they could go down to the store and buy packets of seeds. So let's say that you wanted to go and buy uh, a plant that made blue flowers. You might go to Walmart and go to the garden section and look in the rack and pick out a packet that had blue uh, flowered plants on it. And you would buy that. And when you planted them, you would expect blue flowered plants to grow from it. And that's what Mendel did. He went to the local store. He looked at these packets of seeds for peas. Peas have different flower colors. He decided that he was gonna, he was gonna get two different kinds of uh, pea plants to kind of see if this blending inheritance was true. And so he, he got a purple packet of seeds. Um, you know, they weren't pictures, they were, they, people drew back then. Um, and then he also got white. And so he planted the purple plant, pea plants, and he planted the white pea plants in this garden here. It's right, this is the monastery. Um, and when he planted these, what do you think, what kind of, what color of flower plants would grow from the purple seed pack? I think purple. Yeah, just like, just like if you went to Walmart and bought those or, or wherever, uh, 
and then if you buy, if you planted the white ones, what would you expect to grow out of there? Uh, white. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. So then what Mendel did was he's like, okay, well, I want to cross the purple plants to the white plants, and I'm going to see what comes out because if it's if blending is true, then what would you expect? Uh, purple and white. Well, well, if it, if it mixed together, if blending was true, it would be like mixing purple paint with white paint. So what would you expect to come out of that? It would be like pink. Uh, well, like a light purple. Yeah. And so this is, if blending was true, it would be a light purple. And so Mendel said, well, I'm going to do an experiment, right? And you guys know how to do experiments. We did the you know, make an observation, uh, draw a hypothesis, um, you know, do the experiment and then draw a conclusion. So this is his experiment. Well, here's the problem though. Plants make pollen and pollen, and you probably noticed, you know, driving around Arizona right now that every friggin' Palo Verde and mesquite tree is dropping pollen like crazy. So it, the streets are littered with this yellow pollen. And you know that that blows around. So if he planted purple flowered plants here and white ones here in his garden, then you would expect the pollen to fly all over the place. So he couldn't really control the experiment. He wouldn't know what plant pollinated what plant. And that's why he picked peas because peas have uh, a cover over, they, so they have uh, uh, ovaries and they have, uh, they make their own pollen. So they have both sex parts and, and they have a little flap that covers them up. So they pollinate themselves. We call this self-pollination. And because of that, there's no way that this purple plant could fertilize this white plant here, even though they're right next to each other. Because the structure of the pea plant doesn't allow it. And I'll show you that in a second. But Mendel picked those because of this. He didn't want to have to worry about this pollen flying all over the place. And so he picked pea plants for genetics because they self pollinate and he could also cross pollinate them. And I'll show you how that works. So this is what a pea plant looks like, right? It, it makes pollen and it also has, uh, so that comes from the stamens. And it also has the carpal. You don't need to know these terms. I don't care. Uh, what you should know is it has both female and male parts, right? In the same flower. And so this cover, this flap right here closes. And so there's no way that pollen could get in there unless you open it up. So what Mendel had to do is open this up, get pollen off the white flower, put it on the female parts of the purple flower. And then you guys know that, that seeds are, these are basically uh, fertilized eggs. You know, we, we call them zygotes. And if you plant a seed, right, uh, it goes through cell division, it goes through mitosis, and it makes a plant. All right, so we have, uh, the white, and this is the male parts. Right? And we know that these plants are, are uh, uh, diploid. And that, and you, from last chapter, you know, diploid means that it has one set from mom of chromosomes and one set from dad. Right, so this, this white flowered plant from dad is going to have two chromosomes that it got from its parents, from its mom and dad. And both of these chromosomes are going to be white. So when it goes undergoes my, mitosis, I'm mean, sorry, meiosis, it's going to make sperm or pollen that are going to have the only 
uh, allele or gene on here is white. Geneticists don't like to draw this out, so we use the shorthand. Um, and I'll show you that shorthand in a second. But this is what it looks like inside the cell. So there's a myocyte, you know, that produce gametes through meiosis, and that's going to have the two chromosomes. And on that, it's going to be white, white. And when it goes through cell division, we're going to get uh, two sperm that, that have the white gene. And then we're going to have the, the then we're going to have the dad, I mean the mom, sorry. Mom is uh, purple. And so if we look at the parent, it's going to have the, the myocyte, the the thing that makes the sex cells through meiosis. And so it's gonna have two, two chromosomes, one that it got from its mom and one that it got from its dad. And these are both gonna be purple, which means that it makes a protein that folds in a shape that reflects purple to your eye. All right, so what I didn't tell you is that white is the default. And we talked about this before. Remember, you move into an apartment or a house, the walls are what color? White by default. Unless you paint them, they're going to be white. So in this case, white is a broken, a broken protein. That means there's something wrong with the DNA. Remember, the DNA is turned into RNA, and RNA is turned into protein. And so, since the original code comes from DNA, there's something wrong with the DNA that makes it not produce the protein right. And because of that, since there's no pigment made, there's no paint. If you moved into a house and you had no paint, what color would your walls be? White. Yeah. So it's just, a, it's you have no paint. So you, you only can pass on two white alleles with no paint. The parent, on the other hand, is going to make a protein that's going to make a, like a purple paint. And so when it makes, the, the female is going to make eggs. So it, remember, we, we have to divide this in two. So each of these eggs is going to have one chromosome. We need half the number. And they're both going to make a protein that is purple. All right. So any sperm can fertilize any egg, right? So let's just look at the possible outcome here. Here's a, here's a white sperm, and that's going to fertilize this purple egg. So when that gets fertilized, it's going to make a zygote, right? Two gametes come together and we get a white. We're going to get one that's white. And this offspring got that from, from uh, dad, right? And then the other one that they got from mom is going to be purple. And if you went through all of these combinations, so this sperm fertilized this egg, Remember, it's any sperm can fertilize any egg. This sperm fertilized this egg. Let me change color so it's not so busy. So this sperm fertilized this egg. This sperm fertilized this egg. This sperm fertilized this egg. Or the last possibility is this sperm fertilized this egg. So all four of those possible outcomes, it doesn't matter because mom or dad can only give white and mom can only give purple. So this is always gonna have one white and one purple. Now, let's think about it, let's go back to paint. So if, let's say you moved into your house and you needed one gallon of purple paint to paint the walls purple, you could do that, right? Let's say you painted your wall purple and it took a gallon of paint. So that's analogous to one gene is going to make enough purple pigment to paint the the flower, right? It, it's not a wall, it's a flower. So this is going to make purple pigment to paint the flower purple, right? This one is broken, so it doesn't make anything. So what color is the flower? It's going to be purple. Yeah, it's going to be purple. Now, it, let's think about this. The parent had two, this parent, the mom, was also purple. She had two 
jeans. So that means that she could make an, enough purple to paint her wall with two coats of her flower with two coats of pigment. So now think about it this. So you go to Home Depot and they have a sale. It's buy one, get one free gallon. You buy the exact same color purple and you paint one coat on the wall, right? It's still purple. And you're like, I don't want to waste this. I'm just going to put another coat on the wall because I got all my stuff out. And you paint another coat on there. So is it a different color purple? No, it's isn't it? It would still be purple. Yeah, it would be. Not only would it be purple, but it would still be the exact same color purple if you painted it with one gallon, right? So in this case, this parent isn't going to be more purple, right? Even though it has two genes for purple, then this offspring. So this offspring right here is going to be this one that had. Okay, so let's let let's try to make this not so confusing. So what geneticists do is they they write out things in generations. So we say F1. This would be like your grandparents, right? And so an F1 generation would be. Um, this white and purple. So we know uh, the, I'm just gonna use the letters and I'll explain the rules in a second. But we're gonna use big P because that's what we consider dominant. It shows up in the next generation. And we use little P to represent white because it disappears in the next generation, right? So this, this, right here that we've drawn this thing is we're just going to represent it with a big p i'm sorry wrong one a little p my bad i'm getting confusing myself because it's white right so it's this it's this one right here and this one we're going to also represent that with a little p right here so this together represents this parent's genetic makeup. We don't have to write out all the chromosomes, we're just using letters to represent them. This right here, big P, is represented by this, this chromosome here in the parent, which is gonna make this gammy. So this is purple. This is the other chromosome that also has purple on it and so oh, i'm sorry to rub but so would that be like uh bo this represents both parents correct or both yeah. grandparents? So, so like so let's say in this case this is mom right so here this is mom and let me erase this mess And I'm too busy. All right. So this is mom. I'm just going to write this is mom. So we know that mom inside her cell has a chromosome that she got from her mom, right? From her mom, and a chromosome that she got from her dad, right? And this is, this is mom. This is the the daughter of these grandparents or parents, great the daughter of these parents here. And she has mom is gonna have two chromosomes, right? And and just like us, and they're both gonna make purple. So we just represent it with big P. And that's what this represents. The, the chromosome makeup of this parent of mom. And we're going to cross mom with dad. And dad is represented here. And in dad, we know that he also has a gene uh, that he got from his mom. And he got it from his mom. And this is going to be white because it's broken. And he's going to have a gene that he got from his dad which is also going to make me white because it's broken so this little p little p represents white and white it represents this chromosome and this chromosome 
right? Just without having to draw all this junk out. We just use letters. This big P, big P, I know P's are hard to distinguish, but this big P, big P is mom, which is represented here. And so during meiosis, this is gonna divide, right? And it's gonna make gametes. So we can do the same thing here. Mom is gonna make two gametes and she's gonna be making big P. That's an egg, because she's mom. And that's an egg. And dad's also gonna make two gametes. And that's a sperm, or implants, pollen, same deal. And that's gonna be little p, right? And so that's the same thing that we just did. Any sperm can fertilize any egg, right? So if we do all this, and we're gonna erase this, because it's, again, it's getting kind of busy. I wanna erase this. And we can do this in our head and just say, okay, mom can only give one chromosome, right? If she gives more than that, then it, the, the offspring would be dead. So all she can pass on is big P. Doesn't matter if it's this one or this one, it's just big P. All dad can pass on is little P. So the offspring, and we call this the, the uh, so we call this the parental generation. And we call this the first familial generation. So every child that they have is going to have this genetic makeup. And if we look at their chromosomes, one of them would make a purple pigment. And one of them would make a broken purple, which is white by the point. So because they make one unit of purple, this plant is going to be purple. Not only is it going to be purple, it's going to be the same color purple as mom, where dad is white. So if they had 10 million offspring, every one of those offspring we would expect to be purple. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Since the white trait is lost in that first generation on the daughter, you know, all the children from a uh, purple mom and the white dad from Mendel's seed packets, uh, we, we say that this trait is recessive. Um, and then we say that the purple trait is dominant. And what Mendel showed in this experiment is that they didn't blend, right? Since mom was the exact same color purple as all of her children, then there's no blending because they're not light purple. So Mendel in this experiment basically said, you guys are wrong. Blending theory of inheritance isn't real. And there's somehow... Uh, purple knocks out white and it doesn't show up in the second generation. But now we know why, right? And the, and the reason is, is because white is a default pathway. So it's a broken gene. So this is the offspring that we just had. So remember we had, we had a white, we had a white mom and purple dad and all of those kids had a big P and a little P allele. Now, when when this when these children and usually they're mated together, so all the kids are going to have a, a purple and a white genetic makeup inside their cells, and so they they're going to make gametes through meiosis. And when they do, this parent can make big P. And let's say it's dad, so we'll give it a tail for a sperm, or it can make little p, and we'll say that that's uh, also dad, so we'll have a tail for a sperm. And then let's say that this is a female plant. It's there's their siblings, um, so they have the same genetic makeup. So this one would make eggs, and it would be it would make uh, purple, or or the other possibility is it could make a white egg. Now, we have the same scenario. 
any sperm can fertilize any egg. So this sperm could fertilize this egg. And what will we end up with? Purple. And the genes would be big P, big P. That means that both of the chromosomes make purple. So we get two doses of purple, right? Now, if this sperm could fertilize this egg, and then what will we get? Uh, big P, little P. Big P, little P. And that would also be purple, but it would be one dose, which is enough to make it purple, which is like the paint example. And then um, I'll switch colors here so it's not get so confusing. So this sperm could fertilize this egg. And what would we get? We would get little P, big P. Doesn't matter which order we can flip them around, but it's still going to be purple, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll have one dose. And then this sperm fertilized this egg. And we would get little p, little p, which would be both genes would be broken. So it would go to the default, which is white. And we would have zero doses of purple. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, statistically, each of these would occur with a probability of one fourth. Now, this is where Mendel's math came into play. Um, if you didn't have a good math background in this, you'd never figure this out. So what Mendel knew that, and, and you guys know, if, if you flip a coin, what's the chances it's going to land on heads? 50-50. Right. Or one half. One half of the times we would expect it to be heads. And one half of the time we expect it to be tails. And that's just random luck, right? And so it's the same thing here, except there's four possible outcomes, right? And so there's only two here, it's head or tails. So we just, we just say that's one half, right? One out of two. It's either heads or tails. This one, there's four outcomes. So every one of these has a one fourth chance of occurring. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So that's the rule of multiplication. And, and where it comes from is, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but we draw Punnett squares in genetics to make this not so busy, like all that stuff I've been drawing. So we know that if we have a big P, big uh, little P, sorry, big P, little P cross to a big P, little P, we know that it has to give up one gamete. So if this is dad, we can put dad on this axis. And we know dad has to give up, has to make a one form of this gamete, so big P. And we'll put tails on it to make sure that we distinguish that those are sperm. Or it has to make this. So dad has to make either big P or little P. Remember, because in meiosis, we're halving all of our genetic information. And mom has to do the same. All she can give is a big P egg, or she can make a little P egg. And then any sperm can fertilize any egg. So this is basically all this junk that I drew right here in this in a table form. Now, this sperm fertilizes this egg, what do we get? Big P, big P. This sperm fertilizes this egg, what do we get? Big P, little P. This sperm fertilizes this egg. What do we get? Big P, little P. This sperm fertilizes this egg. We get little P, little P. So it's the same stuff that I drew out here. Now, where did I get the one fourth? Well, the odds this gamete's going to be made is one half, right? And the odds that this gamete would be made is one half. The odds that this egg would be made is one half. And the odds that this would be made is one half. So what, we can, what we're doing is we're doing something called the rule of multiplication. And the rule of multiplication says that I can multiply individual uh, outcomes together to find out what my final outcome statistically would be. So what I'm doing is I'm taking one half. One, there's a one half chance that this sperm would be made, right? Because it's either this or this, like flipping a coin. 
And there's a one half chance that this would be made. This this big P egg would be made. So a one half chance that a big P would come from dad, and a one half chance that a big P would come from mom. And I can multiply that together, and one half times one half is one fourth. So the the chances of getting a big P, big P kid is one fourth. It's the same probability of you flipping a coin two times and it coming up heads both times. So the odds of that is one half for heads the first time times one half for heads the second time. And that would be one fourth. So if you went and flipped the coin twice, the odds that it would fall on heads both times is one fourth. And you could go ahead and flip that coin a thousand times and add it up. And whatever the number of times that you did it times one fourth would be the value that you probably would end up with. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So statistically, we know that the probability is one fourth for all of these. And that's the rule of multiplication, right? So on the test, I might ask you, what's the odds of you flipping a coin? Uh, what's the odds of you flipping a coin three times and it coming up heads all three? It should be three times half. Right, one half times one half times one half. Or you could take the shortcut and say it's one half to the third power, right? Same deal. And so the odds are it'd be one four times one half is one eight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's the rule of multiplication. Um, and then there's a thing called the rule of addition. So if it comes out the same, and it can't because of this is this is just one one outcome. But for here, this is the same as this, right? So I can add these together and that gives me two force, which is one half. So because I can do that, then the probability of it being big P, big P, if, if we these made it to each other, right? Cause they're big P, little P. So the odds that their their offspring would be big P big P is one half. I'm sorry, one fourth. One fourth. The big P little P is also one fourth. Little P big P is also one fourth, and little P little P is also one fourth, which we read up there before. And we figured that out by the rule of multiplication. Now, because these are the same. We can add these together, and that is one half. And and for all the purple ones, we can add together too. So this one's purple, this one's purple, and this one's purple. So we would do one fourth plus one half. We have to uh, get them on the same uh, denominator. So this is the same as two fourths, and two fourths plus one fourth is three fourths. So three fourths of these plants should be purple and one fourth, this is white. One fourth should be white. If this is true, right? And this is how Mendel figured it out because he counted all of these plants. He sat there and he counted 705 purple flower plants, 224 white flower plants, and it turned out that this is really close to this ratio. Uh, we've already talked about recessive. So in this case, recessive is the, the one that went away in the first generation, which is white. Dominant is the one that's present, so that's purple. And this three to one ratio that we just talked about. So uh, let me explain this real quick. So uh, scientists are inherently lazy. That's why they invented the scientific notation and all sorts of stuff. So, it takes a lot longer to write this than it does to write this. And so what we do is we do a ratios of like this to, to represent 
this is the same as three fourths. This is the same as one fourth. And how do I know that? I can just write this, this three to one ratio. If I add them together, I know that's the denominator, right? So I'll give you another example. And we're gonna, we're gonna do this in a second. But let's say that we had a nine to three to three to one ratio. So what does this represent? Well, all you gotta do is add them all up. So nine plus three is 12 plus three is 15, plus one is 16, and that means it's nine sixteenths. Same with this, three sixteenths, three sixteenths, one sixteenths. If I did a one to one ratio, then that would be one plus one is two, so that's one half and one half. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're, not, we're just not writing this out because it takes extra time to do, and it's not, it, you can figure it out from the numbers in the ratio. So that's what a three to one ratio is. And so Mendel wasn't satisfied, you know, he was a scientist and he wanted to make sure he could re repeat this experiment. So there are, other, there are other traits that plants, these pea plants have. The flower color one is the one we focused on, right? It's pretty close to a three to one ratio. It's not exact. And the reason is, think about it this way. Let's say that you flip the coin a hundred times. Is it, what would you expect it to come up heads? How many out of the hundred? Uh, it's 0.5 times 100, so 50%. Yeah, so 50 times you flip the coin, you would expect it to come up heads. Is it always gonna do that? No. No, so there's some variation here, some uncertainty um, because it's, you know, it's random chance, so it's not always gonna be exact. So Mendel didn't get the exact number, but the more times that you flip the coin, like here, he, he counted eight, over 8,000 seed colors. The more you do, the closer you get to that, that magical three to one ratio. Just like if you flip the coin twice uh, and it came up heads both times, that's not as big of a deal if you flipped it a hundred times and it came up head all hundred times, right? Or a thousand times, and it always came up heads. So the more you flip it, the more you would expect it to go to that 50, 50, that one-to-one -one ratio, right? One half heads, one half tails. This is a percent, that's what I heard. Does that make sense? That's the central limit theorem right there. <laughs> so, so Mendel, all these experiments pointed to this three to one ratio. And that made him think, okay, three to one, three to one. And he went back, he worked backwards. And if you read his paper, he worked backwards to figure out that there's two, he didn't know chromosomes, he didn't know genes, he didn't know any of that. He said there's two particles in every pea plant. And that pea plant only passes one of those particles down. He called it purple particles, right? And he called them white particles. And he, he didn't really know that this was the default. So he thought maybe purple was knocking out white somehow. And that's why these were all purple. We now know that it's just because white is just the absence of any purple. But um, he did a good job of figuring out. Uh, so he called this the particulate mechanism of inheritance because he was like, oh, there's purple particles, which we now know, you know, those purple particles are now what we call genes, right? Well, well, technically alleles. And, and those alleles, you know, code for purple or they code for white, you know, and, and so he, he called them particles, but we now call them genes. And that's how Mendel knew uh, that this was uh, how things were inherited, inherited from one generation to the next. There was not blending. He discounted that. He made up a new hypothesis that the everything has two particles and that one of those is passed on and then they work together in the offspring to create that trait. All right, so now let's jump forward. That's just the story of Mendel. And let's talk a little bit about this. So we know that 
uh, when we, you guys use the term gene to, to be brown eyes or blue eyes or green eyes or whatever, but that's not really what, how we do it scientifically. We call them alleles. So a, a gene to a geneticist is actually the trait. So in this case, it would be eye color. And the variant, the variations uh, would be brown, blue, green, right? That's the protein that's made. So in your book, when we talk about the allele for purple flowers, it's what you might call a gene, right? It's an area of DNA, and that's going to make a protein that reflects light in the purple wavelength. So it's going to look purple to your eye. And the other, so remember these are homologs, we can call this number one. One's from mom, one's from dad. And this is for white flowers, right? And so it, it doesn't make the protein right, it's broken, so the default is white. All right, so that's what alleles are. The gene is for flower color, right? Just like this gene is for eye color. And you could, you would have a gene for hair color. And can you name some alleles for me? Be like black hair, brown hair, yep. red hair. Yeah. That's exactly right. So th th do you get the difference between a gene and an allele? So we, we have two alleles that work together to, to, to give us this gene you know, for whatever trait that is. And I know that's confusing because people don't talk that way. Uh, it's just as confusing as, as amylose because no one says amylose, but you know that that means carbs, right? Just like people don't run around going stat, but you watch enough TV uh, hospital dramas to know that means right away. So you're just going to have to get this straight in your head. Now, with that said, I do it too. Like I forget uh, that alleles are separate from genes, and sometimes I use them interchangeably. But if I'm writing a paper that's going to be critiqued or whatever, I might double check that to make sure I'm using the terms right. Um, but for this class, I'm not going to be that much of a stickler about it. I just want you to be aware. We already talked about the word locus, and that should be in your vocabulary for biology. Um, that just short. That's just short for location. So it's where that gene is located on that particular chromosome. In this case, it's here. And there could be another gene here that is for the uh, flower height or something. And so it would have a different locus, a different location. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, perfect. All right. So. I'm not going to dwell on Mendel's hypothesis too much, but what you should get out of it is, so we have the parental generation, right? That, that's like the grandparents. In our, in, a, in our example, it was the, the purple dad and the white mom. Did I get that backwards? Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. And they got together and they had kids, right? And we know, we call that the F1 generation. And we know that uh, this can only give big P and this can only give little P. So every one of those kids is gonna look like this. And this is gonna be purple. This is gonna be purple. This is gonna be white. And a lot of times in genetics, I mean, we don't do this with humans, but we do this with mice. and fruit flies and all kinds of stuff we study in the lab. We just breed them to their, their brothers and sisters because we know that they all have to have the same genetics. So we, we breed it to something that we know and that we call out the F2 generation is their offspring. And so we know in the end that this is gonna be uh, all three of those outcomes and it's gonna be in a specific ratio. So this is gonna be a one half to uh, 
sorry, I screwed that up. One fourth to one half to one fourth ratio. Um, and the way we write this out is it's a one to two to one, which is one four, two fourths, one fourth. This is what we call the genotype because it it, it shows the, the the gene, right? The alleles. The phenotype is going to be different. So for the phenotype, this is what we see. And that would mean purple or white flower. So the purple ratio is three purple to one white. And that's the phenotype. So just to recap, the genotype is big P, big P, big P, little P, little P, little P. And that's one to two to one. Remember, we just divide that by four. The phenotype, if you look at these, this is purple and this is purple. So we lump them together because they look the same. So it's three, two plus one is three, and that's purple. And then this one, this one is gonna be white. So three to one is white. <coughs> All right. The law of segregation is a Mendel is a law that Mendel said that these particles they divide they divide separately. Um, so basically, what it's saying is, here's Dad, right? He's only he's going to divide and he's only he's going to give these gametes, and Mom is going to divide. Sorry, Mom's going to divide, and she can only give these white gametes. So that's the law of segregation, that these separate during meiosis. And we make sex cells, right? And you knew that from chapter 13. Nothing surprising. All right, here's some terms. So in, in the last chapter, we talked about zygotes, right? And you remember the word homo and biology means same. So a homozygous person is someone that has the same traits on both of their chromosomes. So it could be big P, big P, right? Or it could be little P, little P. Those are both homozygous because they're both the same. White, white, purple, purple. In the zygote, in the fertilized egg. Now we have to distinguish this one from this one because we can't just call it homozygous because they're different. So we have to say this one is homozygous dominant. Remember, because the purple, the purple trait came out in that F1 generation. So remember, we have parental F1 and F2. This is like your grandparents. And this would be like your parents. And then this would be like you. So those are the generations. All right, so back to this, we use homozygous dominant to say that it has both dominant alleles, in this case, both purple, or homozygous recessive, where it has both recessive alleles, like this one, which is white, white. So this individual is homozygous dominant. This individual is homozygous recessive. Make sense? Yes. All right. Now, though, you know, uh, we're still talking about zygotes, fertilized eggs. And so, and now we're talking about hetero, which means different. So a heterozygote is something that has one of each. In this case, purple and white. Um, and so we can distinguish all, this is the only three possible outcomes, right? Both purple, one purple, one white, or both white. So uh, I would name this one heterozygous, this one is homozygous dominant. This one is homozygous recessive. And that's how geneticists talk. That 
saves us from having to write all this stuff out. So it's even easier than what we were doing before, which was super busy. And then the other terms that you need to know are phenotype. That's what you see, right? Like purple flowers, brown hair, blue eyes. That's a phenotype. The genotype is what genes cause that. So just if I if I went if I went out of a field and I told you to go pick me a purple pea plant, would you know what the genotype is? It could either be dominant or it could be, I'm sorry, it could be either uh, homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Exactly. You wouldn't know unless you looked at the genes and the you would you'd have to look at the alleles because they both look the same. So a genotype is different than a phenotype. You can't see the genotype. You have to do, you know, some sort of test on it. And so, you know, today we would just, you know, uh, we could look, we could examine the gene, right? Just like Maury Povich figures out who the baby's daddy is by looking at the DNA. But that's not always available. And so there's ways that you can test the genotype uh, by breeding two uh, organisms together. All right. And then some of these things, they have different terms. Like you probably heard the term thoroughbred, right? So a thoroughbred is something that is homozygous, right? All of its genes are the same. It's bred to be uniform. Where like uh, like a, a horse that wasn't a thoroughbred would be heterozygous. You wouldn't know what offspring came from it. So uh, because you know you could get any of those outcomes, right? But a thoroughbred, when you breed it to another thoroughbred, just like a purple plant, you breed to white, you know what you're gonna get. Um, and so this is important in breeding race horses and dogs and chickens and plants, corn plants. I mean, you know, just a good example of this is that, you know, when the pilgrims came and they had Thanksgiving, and you probably know about that, the corn that they had ate from America was not sweet at all, not the corn that you eat now. Over, you know, hundreds of years, they said, the, the people that grew corn said, oh, this corn's sweeter than this corn. I'm going to breed the sweet corn to the other sweet corn. And guess what? The offspring were sweet and then they bred the sweet ones to the other sweet ones and before you knew it you got really sweet corn original corn was had a lot of protein in it if you look at a corn kernel so back in the day this much of the corn kernel was protein and this much was carbs right sugars and it kept breeding it to make this smaller the proteins be smaller and the carbs be bigger and that makes it sweeter and today's corn looks more like this it's just a little tiny bit of protein in it and the rest of it's mostly carbs and so by breeding this over generations and generations you've bred out uh the you know you probably tasted protein bars they taste like dirt so you know you bred out the dirt taste out of corn and made it more sweet. And this is the corn that you generally buy at the store. It's nothing like what it used to be. This is what they feed cows and chickens to. All right, so Punnett squares are an easy way to sort of figure out what these gametes are that are gonna be made. So we talked about P generation, the parental generation, it's like the grandparents. We talked about Mendel bred the purple flowers to the white and we know Big P, big P is representing dominant, a little p, little p, or homozygous dominant. Little p, little p is homozygous recessive. This can only make a big P gamete, right? This one can only make a little p gamete. So we know that the offspring have to be big P, little p. There's no other outcome. And they're all gonna be purple. That's the first generation. And now half of the gametes that it makes are gonna be big P and half of the gametes it makes are gonna be little p. And so we can put that on a Punnett square, which is like this. And we know that for them, for uh, this is gonna be bred to another 
another big P little P plant. So we we have one parent, the female that makes eggs, uh, is going to be big P little P. So we'll just put this eggs, and I'll just draw circles around them to represent eggs, and that would be mom, of course. And then dad would make sperm, and we'll put little tails on it to remind us. And this would be the sperm or pollen. And then we just say, would this sperm fertilizes this egg? And so we can just draw this out. We've already, I've already done this, but that's how we come about with this three to one ratio, right? Three purple to one white. And then just remember, this means homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive, which we already covered. All right. We also covered this too. Um, it's just a refresher. Remember the genotypic ratio is one. Genotypic ratio is one to two to one. Remember we add those all up, so it's divided by four. One four, two fourths, one fourth would be one. So one fourth would be big P, big P. Uh, two fourths or one half would be big P, little P. And then one fourth or uh, would be little P, little P. And we know that this is white. This is purple, one dose of purple, two doses of purple, same color purple. If we look at the phenotype, that ratio is different. It's three to one, and we already did this. So that means three plus one is four. So three fours are purple, one fourth is white. All right. So now, uh, we, if we can do a DNA test, we can always cross it to something that we know. So if I send you out in a field to pick a flower that you knew its genotype, what genes were in it, what color flower would you bring me? White or purple? Can you repeat that question? So if I asked you to bring me a flower that you know what its genes looked like on the inside, which one, what color would you bring me, white or purple? White? Yeah, because white has to be little p, little p. No matter what white flower you bring to me, we know its genes are both little p, little p. If you, we already talked about it. If you brought me a purple one, we wouldn't know if it's homozygous dominant or recessive. So this is what we know, right? And, and we breed it to something that we don't know. And this is called a test cross. Now you can't really do this in humans, right? But they do it a lot in horses and chickens and things like that to make sure you're not getting ripped off, right? So like if I was gonna go buy a million dollar horse and I didn't have DNA, and this was before DNA testing, I would like, I wanna see its offspring because if it has, well, I'll show you why. So if it's a thoroughbred, then that would be me, that would mean that it's purple, right? I wouldn't, know if it's big P, big P or big P, little P. This would, horse would not be worth as much as this horse. So how do I know if I'm getting the million dollar horse or the junk horse? And I do a test cross. So I know I breed it to something I know. Um, and then I look at the offspring. So in this case, if it's a thoroughbred, a a true breeding, a purebred line, that means it's going to be homozygous. In this case, it's big P, big P, that's the only homozygous here. And so I would know because all the offspring would look like the parent. Does that make sense? Yes. It would all be purple. But if I bred it to the heterozygote, the outcome would be different. The outcome would be I could get big P here with little P, or I could get little P with little P. So I would get some white flowers when I did this cross. So this, so let me just write over here. So if I did big P, big P to little P, little P, all the offspring would be big P, little P, which would be purple. I can see that right away. There'd be no white ones. But if I bred it to a heterozygote, you know, I don't know this. It's just a purple flower to me. 
um, I would get half would be purple and half would be white, half purple, half white. Then I would know that if I get any white flowers, it's a heterozygous. If I get all purple, it's a homozygous dominant. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a test cross. Okay. So Mendel came up with a different law called independent assortment. Remember, we talked about independent assortment in chapter 13, where the where the tetrads line up and it could it could be. So I'm just gonna use blue as dad. So so I'll make this smaller. Um, so all mom could line up on one side, and then we would get uh, gametes that are all mom. And same thing with dad. Or the other option is that it can line up like this, where they flip. And then when it goes through cell division, um, it would end up being, uh, this one would be dad, and this one would be mom. Because this gets divided in half again, second division of SS2. Same thing here. So this gamete is different than this gamete. Um, and that's independent assortment. So what Mendel said was that traits assort can assort independently of each other. Let me uh, do it this way. So let's say that um, Let's say that we have, I'm just gonna draw two chromosomes. So one is for mom, one is from dad. They're on a locus, right? Where it's located on that chromosome is a gene. And we're gonna stick with Mendel's thing. So Mendel did seed color and it was either yellow or green. So let's just say uh, that this is for seed color. Does that make sense? And then, um, on another chromosome, we'll call that number one, we'll call this number two. There's a gene for uh, seed. So this is round and this is wrinkled. So this is seed shape. Seed color, seed shape. Now let's just add some colors in here. So let's say that this one is, uh, Let's say this one is uh, yellow. And let's say this one is green. And let's say that this one is round. And this one is wrinkled. Okay. So now when, and this is in one, one parent. So we could get a division like this, right? And then the gamete would be yellow, which is dominant, and uh, round, which is also dominant. You guys see that? We can divide it in half. This gamete would be green and wrinkled. So it would be little y, which is green, and little r, which is wrinkled. So that this would be the gametes it could be. And those are the only games. But if it flips, right? Remember, it can flip on the metaphase plate. So round would end up on this side, and wrinkled would end up on the other side. So now we would have yellow, yellow wrinkled, because these flip on the metaphase plate. Yellow wrinkled, and this one would be green and not not wrinkled anymore, but ran. So it would be green and ran. So we could get all four 
of these variable gametes. And that's what it's showing you here, right? So uh, yellow, round, yellow, wrinkled, green, round, uh, and green, wrinkled. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Now, the reason that independent assortment is important is because this only works if the genes are on different uh, chromosomes. Let's imagine that they're on the same chromosome. We're going to do the same thing, but, but we don't need to draw the extra chromosome. So we have seed color right here, and this is yellow. And this is green. And we also have seed shape, same chromosome. So this is going to be round. And this is going to be wrinkled. I'm sorry, it's hard to write with this board. Okay, so so we know that it's going to go through meiosis and it's going to go through division and it'll make a gamete. And that gamete is going to be yellow and it's also going to be round, right? And this one is going to be green and wrinkled. Now, this could also flip on the metaphase plate. But what happens if it flips? If it flips, uh, it'll be, are you talking about the top one or the bottom one? No, the, the whole chromosome would have to flip. <coughs> so this one is now on this side. Right, I'll just draw it again. So this one would be green on the right and also wrinkled, right? I mean, on the left. And on the right, it would be yellow and round. This is just, I'm just flipping these back. So what gametes could this make? It can make a... Uh... Let's see. So it's going to be green and round? Uh, no, green and round are on different chromosomes. Oh. When it, when it goes through meiosis, too, these are going to get divided together. <coughs> so it can make a. Um... Green and wrinkled. Right. And yellow and round. Right. So it doesn't matter what side it lines up on. It can only make green and wrinkled or yellow and red. You guys see that? Yeah. Because there are different chromosomes here, we can make all four gametes. But this cannot make all four gametes. So independent assortment only these only assort independently <coughs> if they're on different chromosomes. If they're on the same chromosome, we call them linked. And things get weird when things are on the same chromosome. All right. So independent assortment means that traits assort independently. And so we can go through this Punnett square. And then I'll just draw it out and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. So the, the Punnett square is, now we're talking about two traits. So seed color and seed shape. So just like you have to pass on here one, uh, one, allele of your eye color and one allele of your hair color to your kids, you couldn't pass them two eye colors and no hair color. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You have to have one of each. So you have to pa pass on a color. Oh my God, it's really dusty because there's construction here. It's like making my allergies go nuts. <coughs> um, and I guess all the pollen on the ground isn't helping either. So we can make yellow and round. Right, that's one gamete, which we just showed. We have to divide this into four sections. So yellow and round, uh, yellow wrinkled, uh, green round, 
and and green wrinkled. This is the eggs that can be made, and then the same thing with the sperm. And I'm not, I won't draw the whole thing out, but these are all the outcomes that you can get. And if you add them all up, you'll see that they come out to be a nine to three to three to one ratio. And so this ratio, nine to three to three to one, it, this one has both dominant traits. These have one each dominant and recessive. So this could be uh, yellow and wrinkled or green and uh, round. And then this one, this 1 16th has both recessive traits. So this is called a dihybrid cross. Remember a hybrid is two, one of each, like a heterozygote, hetero, and hybrid are the same. And so it has both yellow and, and green and round and wrinkled the same cell. And that's why we call it a dihybrid cross. All right, so we already talked about this. I'm gonna skip that. Uh, we talked about the probability and statistics of this and the rule of multiplication and the rule of addition. Um, so what I want you guys to work on in the meantime is I want you to do these practice problems. And then uh, when we have lecture next Tuesday, um, I, I want you to have figured these out. And then we'll go over them. So I want you to work on these practice problems as homework. Any questions? Uh, not as of right now. Okay. There's also a section on the home tab in Canvas that has genetics practice problems. You probably won't be able to do all of them yet, but by the end of this chapter, make sure that you guys do those. And there's also answers to the genetic practice problems too. So those are the kind of questions that you'll see on the test. So make sure that you practice them because that's how we get good at stuff, right? Uh, you know, like pro golfers, pro football players, they don't just wake up and go play. They practice a lot. Um, and if you want to be good at uh, biology and genetics, you're going to have to practice these, these, uh, these uh, genetics problems. All right, so I'm going to end it here. Uh, I'm going to jump over to office hours. If anybody has any questions, they can meet me there. Otherwise, have a good weekend. Uh, I have a department meeting tomorrow, so I can't do office hours tomorrow, but I'll do office hours on Monday, and then we'll pick up lecture on Tuesday. All right. Thank you, Professor. All right. All right. Have a good one. Bye.